And that's the end of free agency for now. Welcome into Fantasy Baseball today on Thursday, December 2nd. Frank Sample joined, as always, by Scott White. We had a flurry of free agent moves that will hit right here at the top of the podcast. Plus, we're introducing a new meter on today's podcast. You no, know, in season, we do the drop o meter, the worry, the worryometer. Uh, every time I say it, I, I change it up, but we'll be discussing <laughs> worryometer or worry o meter. Worry o meter, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, <laughs> we're going to be talking about players who might be done producing at a high level in fantasy baseball. Are they? I don't know. We'll figure that out. Scotty, how are we doing? Are you ready to see Freddie Freeman in pinstripes? No, no, don't even <laughs> say that, Frank. That That's horrible. That is. <laughs> No, no, I've, I have, I am scared, Frank. I'm, I'm nervous. I don't know why the deal isn't already done. I don't know why it wasn't done in spring training, frankly, but, uh, I, I don't like the idea of going into this lockout, not knowing. And, um, I hope news breaks while we're recording because that's probably the last chance. I don't, I've never wanted, I've never wanted an impending free agent back so badly in all my life and in all my years of Braves fandom. And I I'm sorry to, to go all Uber fan on you here. I feel like winning the world series has like (laughs) brought out, brought out the Homer in me in a way that it's never been on display in 14 years of working for CBS. But, but now it's like, I, I can't have it. I can't. I can't stand. I can't stomach the thought of Freddie Freeman in another uniform. It needs to happen, Frank. Yeah, we need him back. Well, we are recording this. Uh, it's right around ten thirty Eastern time here, uh, Wednesday night. So there's still a chance some things can happen before we hit midnight. And when we hit midnight, it looks like we are going to go into uh, an actual lockout where free agency will be frozen for um, I don't know however long it takes for the new CBA to be figured out. We are not alone. Joining us on today's podcast, a contributor for NBC Sports Edge, Fan Tracks, Roto Ranks, and New Life Fantasy. He's been part of a lot of our mock drafts, uh, but it's the first time here on the podcast. Welcome in, Micah Henry. What is going on, man? What is going on, guys? I appreciate you having me on. It's, it's, I'm, I, have, I, I feel like I haven't talked baseball in months at this point, so I'm excited to just ramble on about everything that's going on, you know? Yeah, I mean, look, we've been doing it. It's definitely a weird time because uh, obviously we're in the middle of fantasy football season, mm, uh, yep. but it's just like really unique right now because of everything that's going on with the the CBA and the potential lockout. Like there's a lot of moves happening. It, it's like trade deadline all over again. So uh, it's really fun to react to a, a lot of the things that are happening right now. Uh, make sure to follow Micah on Twitter at Fantasy Central One, and let's jump right into it. We'll hit some of these uh, signings we did not do an emergency podcast for, for one Javier Baez, Scott, unfortunately, I guess, I don't know. He wasn't worthy of the emergency. We're fresh out of emergency. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, Um, Seriously. uh, (laughs) I will reveal, let's talk about the contract and then, and then I'll set it up for you here, Scotty, but six years, $140 million to the Detroit Tigers for Javier Baez. He has an opt out after the second year, hit 265, 31 homers, 18 steals. This past season, he finished as the sixth best shortstop in five by five roto, but only averaged 2.9 fantasy points per game because of his lack of plate discipline. Uh, Very clear at this point that the short in 2020 was the outlier for Javier Baez. He's been between an 813 and 881 OPS in each of his past three full seasons. Now, unfortunately, Scott, this might not be the best move for his fantasy value because we know Comerica Park is a bigger park, and according to StatCast, he would have hit just 24 home runs if he played all of his games last season in Detroit. Obviously, you know, that's not realistic, but this doesn't seem like a very good venue change for Javier Baez's value. What do you yeah, think? 20, 24 versus the 31 he actually yep. hit, which, you know, it's it's worth saying. I, I don't know how scientific that is. It's really just it's really just measuring the distance of the batted balls and the dimensions of the park, and there are a lot of other factors that come into play there. So, yeah, I mean... Detroit's a tougher place to hit than than Wrigley Field. We saw that when Nick Castellanos went the other direction from Detroit to Chicago. Um, but yeah, Javier Baez, you know, he, he's not known for hitting cheap shots. His average home run distance, at least the last couple of years, considerably more than Nick Castellanos is. I, I don't know that the venue is really the biggest concern here. Of course, it's not good, but the bigger concern is just that you know, you, you use the term outlier to describe Javier Baez's 2020 season. Really, really liar. He became 
even worse with the plate discipline last year. And the only reason it didn't destroy him is because he became even more of an outlier in the two areas where he was already a huge outlier, home run to fly ball rate and, and Babip. He career highs in both. And that was, that was hard for a player like Javier Baez to do because they're already so consistently high. Um, so at some point, and you know, he's, he's entering his thirties. Let's see. To, ooh, today's is actually his birthday, December 1st. So did he just turn 29? Yeah, he just turned 29. So he's not quite 30 yet, but as he enters his thirties, you wonder, you know, if he loses some of that natural athleticism, that's driving those outlier stats. Um, how quickly could it all fall apart for him? I don't think it's going to happen in 2022, but th there's always that chance. So I, I see him as more of a mid round type with the potential for early round numbers, but, but somebody I'm never particularly excited to draft. Yeah. I think the last point that you brought up there, the athleticism, he is a freak athlete and that's why he's able to uh, outperform these uh this lack of plate discipline right it's like when he puts the ball in play hits the ball really hard uh he's super fast as well so he doesn't steal a ton of bases but 18 this past season uh definitely valuable for fantasy baseball purposes his adp is basically the same as Corey seager right now according to the nfbc right around pick 68 so that's a mid sixth round pick in a 12 team league mike i don't know if you've done anything rankings wise yet or how much you've looked into it but who would you rather have between those two we have javier baez now in detroit we have Corey seager in texas you know, it, it really it really comes down to you know where, where my team is at at that you know sixth, seventh, whatever uh, round they'll, they'll be at. I think you know if it came down to it, I'd take Sears just because I, I like the 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 bad average upside more. I like the you know the home run upside more. I I, tr I think he's a better hitter overall, so I think I trust him more. Bias maybe if I want steals, but I think I take the better hitter, better player in Seager. Yep, and I'm assuming you would do the same, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's, there's no doubt about that. I know you still like your boy, Corey Seager, uh, quite a bit there. Marcus Stroman signed a three-year, $71 million deal with the Chicago Cubs, which includes an opt-out after the second year. Uh, and there's like a bunch of weird like elevator uh, type incentives here where if he pitches over 160 innings uh, per season, he gets like $2 million more. So he chases the money, which I have absolutely no problem with. Like whenever players want to get paid, like, Sure, uh, I'm all for it. He finished as the SP28 in 5 by 5 Roto this past season. Just 12 fantasy points per game, which was the SP54 for Marcus Stroman, which I found surprising. Usually that's his better format, but he did have a lot of five-inning starts this past season. A 302 ERA, a 115 whip, still under eight strikeouts per nine. He did introduce a new splitter, which was a very good pitch for him. Uh, Michael, we'll start with you this time. What do you think about this move, Marcus Stroman, going over to the Chicago Cubs? You know, I'm, I'm expecting the similar numbers to be honest. You know, I don't, I don't, as you mentioned, this, the new uh splitter, uh, the new you know pitch that could help him maybe get more strikeouts. Kind of, I, I don't, I don't, I didn't look up, I didn't look up the numbers, but you know, I don't, I don't know if that really helped him that much. But I'm expecting the similar numbers overall. You know, it's, it's mid, you know, 3.5 something, 3.7 ERA. You know, just not nothing special, but helpful. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, that that kind of describes Marcus Stroman, uh, his fantasy yeah. career. You know, he's he's mostly been helpful. You look at his career numbers, and he's right there in that, like, mid to highest threes ERA. Scott, what do you think? Uh, Marcus Stroman right now, ADP, early ADP is 161.23, just three spots ahead of Eduardo Rodriguez, who finds himself in a new home as well with the Detroit Tigers. What do you think about this move for Stroman? Who would you rather have, him or Erod? I'd rather have Stroman because you have a better idea what you're getting. I think Eduardo Rodriguez, just by virtue of having more strikeout upside, has more overall upside. But Stroman's very steady. And, you know, you don't like him going to a non-contender uh, in the Cubs because obviously that hurts his win potential. But he's coming off a season where he went 10 and 13 with the Mets and still managed to be uh, pretty useful in fantasy. So uh, we, we, you know, I, I don't expect the win-loss record to be much worse than 10 and 13. It's potentially get better even for a worse team. I do think it's interesting that the Cubs are, were the team that signed him. That Like, I feel like this offseason, I, I feel like we haven't seen one like this in, I don't know, like 20 years. That's That may be going back too far, but it it just seems like teams are making moves regardless of their where they are where their where their contention trajectory is you know <laughs> like Dodgers and Yankees done basically nothing right 
you, you got the Rangers making signing three players to big contracts, two of the biggest middle infielders on the market. And, and now you have the Cubs in play for one of the biggest free agent pitchers. Well, we thought they were just in the beginning stages of a rebuild, right? They just traded everybody away last July. And now what are, what are they doing? My, signing Marcus Stroman and on a three year yeah. deal, no less. Like do yeah. they expect to contend next year? I, that, that would be surprising. That would, that would definitely be uh, an unconventional return to, to contention. Yeah, it is pretty random. You're, you're right about that. The Rangers spending a lot of money. The Cubs don't look like they're ready to compete. Uh, I, I feel comfort, comfortable saying anytime soon. But uh, yeah, I guess maybe they just wanted someone to anchor their, their pitching staff. And the other day, Scott, we spoke about potentially drafting National League Central pitchers, but probably more likely on the Brewers or Cardinals because you get to face that Cubs lineup. So unfortunately, uh, Mark Stroman cannot do that. He'll still get the Pirates. But uh, yeah, I, I think you know it doesn't really change much from the win potential. Uh, is still not very good for Marcus Stroman. Chris Taylor headed back to the Los Angeles Dodgers on a four-year, $60 million deal. Uh, had another solid season, 254 batting average, 20 homers, 13 steals, 92 runs scored, over 148 games. Scott, I don't think this really changes much for Chris Taylor. Uh, maybe it throws some cold water on Gavin Lux, who we spoke about the other day. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, the, I, I mean, obviously Corey Seager is out of the picture now, so if there were any concerns about Chris Taylor's playing time, you know, he's going to play every day. I don't, I don't know if he'll be the everyday second baseman or if he'll platoon with Lux there, maybe split time with Pollock in left field. Maybe Max Muncy isn't ready for the start of the season. Bellinger moves back to first base. Taylor plays center field every day for a while. But one way or another, he's going to be in the lineup. Obviously, the Dodgers prioritized him and he prioritized the Dodgers. I read on, read on Twitter. Uh, I think maybe some people were underwhelmed by the amount of money he got, but he really wanted to go back to the Dodgers. And, um, yeah, I feel like, uh, I feel like he'll, he'll be a serviceable starter in fantasy, whether it's at second base, shortstop, the outfield, wherever, wherever he ends up eligible. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned Max Muncy there. I think that's a possibility. Definitely. Uh, Muncy could play some second base as well. Once the Dodgers sign Freddie Freeman, uh, no, I'm just playing with you. <laughs> just going to keep taking those jabs, Scotty. <laughs> No, stop no. it. Stop it. <laughs> we I don't had a even bunch, want to hear it. We had a bunch of reliever moves. Uh, Rice Lee Iglesias, big contract, four years, $58 million contract, returning to the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim. He just finished as the RP2 behind only Liam Hendricks. I want to talk more about Mark Melance. Signed a two-year deal, $14 million contract with the Arizona Diamondbacks. He just led baseball with 39 Another one. saves. Another one, right? What are the Diamondbacks doing signing Mark Melanson? <laughs> I guess they wanted some assurance uh, in the back end of their bullpen, but um, he did falter a little bit. Mark Melanson did in September. He had an ERA over four in that month. It's Obviously, it's such a small sample size for a reliever. I'm a little bit skeptical uh, that he can keep overperforming his peripheral stats. I mean, he's getting older, obviously, here, but the unquestioned closer for the Arizona Diamondbacks. Michael, what do you think about this move, Mark Melanson, to Arizona? I, I expect less save opportunities on a you know team that won't win as many games or have the likelihood of winning as many games as of right now. But I do think he'll be a <clears throat> excuse me. I think he'll be a reliable uh, source of save just because you know he's he can do it. He can get it done even if he does have like a three point five uh, four area. I think he'll be the closer the entire season as long as he doesn't you know get get hurt or whatever. Yeah, yeah, I mean, unquestionably, he's going to be the guy there. How about this, Scott? Corey Knable to the Philadelphia Phillies on a one-year, $10 million contract. Pitched really well for the Dodgers this past season, but it was only 25 and two-thirds innings. So, again, smaller sample size for him. A 2.52 ERA, 0 0.97 whip, 10.5 K per nine. Uh, and the fastball velocity was back up closer to where he was at when he was in his prime, when he was saving all those games for the Milwaukee Brewers. Ian Kennedy is a free agent, so... I'm, I'm guessing as of now, Corey Knebel is the leader for the Philadelphia Phillies. So a lot can change. Yeah, and, and I think there, there may be some semi-clarity, as much clarity as we ever get about the closer role um, these days. Dave Dombrowski, who's, of course, running the Phillies now, uh, after this signing, he, he was quoted as saying, we're not necessarily going after a closer at this time which maybe means they found their closer. As you mentioned, Kennedy's gone. Knable was a high-end closer. Uh, I think it was 2017. He had 39 saves for the Brewers with 
low ERA, elite K per nine health problems since then, obviously, but he looked great when he was healthy last year for the Dodgers. He looked like he was basically back to that 2017 form. And, uh, you know, he could be a pretty exciting closer. So hopefully, hopefully that's what ends up happening. But at, as, as I intimate, oh, my camera's shifting angles on me. <laughs> What's going on there? It's got <laughs> a lot of headspace all of a sudden. I wanted to show off the top of the Christmas tree behind me. Um, what was I saying? Oh yeah. Uh, I, I don't think we're, I don't think we're going to know for sure who the Phillies closer is, you know, unless they trade for Kimbrell or something. Yeah. Uh, even heading into opening day, I don't. I don't think we'll know. I, I think that's just the way most teams play it these days. Yeah, and, and I think that's the the next name I wanted to mention was Craig Kimbrell because we we missed this one last week, but uh, Kendall Graveman signs with the White Sox on a three year, twenty four million dollar contract, which I think only solidifies that Craig Kim Kimbrell will be traded at some point this offseason. I think the Phillies make a lot of sense. I think the San Diego Padres now that they. Uh, do not have a closer. Could make some sense. A reunion there with Craig Kimbrell. Speaking of the Padres, they did sign a reliever, Robert Suarez, to a one-year deal with a player option for 2023. Admittedly, did not know much about this guy before he signed, but a hard-throwing right-handed reliever who just posted a 1.16 ERA with 42 saves over in uh, the Japanese League with the Hanshin Tigers. Um just under a strikeout per inning, too. So I don't, I don't know how much strikeout upside is there, but uh, he's someone who has handled that role before. We'll see what else, what other moves the Padres make in the offseason. A few other smaller ones here. Rich Hill signed a one year deal with the Boston Red Sox, 3.86 ERA, 1 to 1 whip this past season. Uh, Mikey, you think anything left here for Rich Hill when it comes to fantasy? Maybe, you know, yeah, he had some glimpses last year, you know, but I, I, I think there's going to be more inconsistency than anything going forward, you know, just, just because of injuries, performance, you know, everything, but I will, I will take him if, if I, if, if, you know, if I had my rotation all set and I may, maybe want some upside the back end of my rotation, back end of my bench, I'll, you know, maybe take a flyer on him and see what happens. Yeah. Here's, I'm, here's what, here's what I wonder about with, with the Rich Hill signing is they, they, they signed Michael Walker, the Red Sox did earlier this off season, which, you know, Michael Walker, whatever, take him or leave him. But I presume they signed him to be in the rotation. I was counting on Tanner Houck being in the rotation as good as he looked down the stretch last year. Um, seems like he has a lot of strikeout potential, but there's not room for all three of those guys. Yeah, I mean they're talking yeah. about Garrett Whitlock being in the rotation too. So. Oh yeah. yeah, I'm not even, I'm not even factoring him in. Yeah. Um, so I'm I'm disheartened to hear that Rich Hill is is now joining the Red Sox because I, I'm not sure he's one of the most deserving five candidates for that team at this point. He was he had he was he had like an eight game stretch from the end of April to the beginning of June where he had a 0.99 ERA, I believe it was. And and so his season long numbers look pretty good because of that. But I think yeah. from that point forward, early June on, he had like a four thirty six ERA, something like that, high whip too. I, I don't I don't think there's much left for Rich Hill, and I'd rather see those innings go to Tanner Houck. Oh yeah, there's no doubt about that. I think Tanner Houck, uh, before these signings, was going to be a pretty popular, you know, late round sleeper with with pretty massive upside uh, for 2022. We'll see what happens. I don't know if you also saw this, Scott, but James Paxton. Signed with the Red Sox, a one-year, $10 million deal. They have a two-year club option. So I guess if he looks good when he returns in likely the second half of the season, he had Tommy John surgery in the in the end of April last year, uh, then they can opt into those next two seasons, 2023 and 2024. Yeah. But obviously that's for later on uh, in well, this upcoming season. The, the timing of the surgery was end of April last year. So you think 18 months? Uh, I think it's possible I don't even know 50, 50 shot. I would say that Paxton doesn't even pitch this year. So they're paying him 10 million for the right of re first refusal in 2023 and 2024, basically, which is interesting. I mean, clearly, clearly they think uh, there's more to be had here in James Paxton being in his mid thirties, but you know, he was still a big strikeout guy for the Yankees when he was last healthy. Mm -hmm. Alex Cobb to the Giants is official. We spoke about that on our previous podcast. Uh, the numbers there, two years, $20 million deal. The Cubs signed Jan Gomes to a two-year, $13 million deal. Uh, Micah, do you think this means that they will try and trade away Wilson Contreras? You know, it's possible. Gomes, Gomes is not – he's not the guy that you want as your catcher one in the, you know, typical one-catcher league, maybe two-catcher league you had as your second catcher. But, I mean, 
it's possible since it's a two-year deal, they keep him there and they, you know, deal with Contreras for whatever they can get. You know, I don't, I don't know. We'll see what happens. Yeah, uh, Universal DH. I mean, I guess that could open up some some playing yeah. time if they wanted to play That's Wilson true. Contreras there and maybe try him out uh, at first base, something like that. Uh, but come on, Frank Schwindel. There's no way we're getting rid of Frank. <laughs> <laughs> the Padres acquired Jorge Alfaro from the Mets. They now have Austin Nola, Alfaro, and prospect Luis Campusano, who is waiting in the wings. Uh, Alfaro did play some outfield for the Marlins down the stretch. So, you know, maybe using him in some kind of dual role capacity. I, I don't know what's going to happen. The Marlins acquired Joey Wendell from the Tampa Bay Rays for outfield prospect Cameron Meisner, whom I spoke with Paul Spora about last week when we had him on the podcast. He was down at AFL, uh, Spore was, and he said that Cameron Meisner was someone who stood out to him. So no surprise the Tampa Bay Rays go out and acquire him for uh, Joey Wendell. We had the non-tender deadline Tuesday night. The biggest names worth mentioning here, Matthew Boyd, non-tendered by the Detroit Tigers. Chad Cool, non-tendered with the Pirates. Eh, not the biggest name. Uh, Robert Gazelman, non-tendered by the Mets. The Yankees did tender a contract to one Gary Sanchez. So looking like he will be the starting catcher for my New York Yankees, which kind of done, kind of done with Gary Sanchez. Guy, wish, <laughs> wish we were trying something else out, but uh, it doesn't look like that can happen. Uh, Matthew Boyd, anything like he's probably the biggest name that was non tendered. Anything left there, Scott? I, I tried to make him a thing this past year. You you shot me down. Yeah, repeatedly. I <laughs> shot you down. No, I haven't. I think, uh, I think Matthew Boyd's, um, star has burned out already it was it was very short-lived basically that was it 2019 or was it 2018 it was that one season where he struck out everybody and then it was just a total aberration i believe way it was too 20, home run prone 2019 yeah um and obviously he had some he had some uh pretty pretty big arm issues last year that he didn't he didn't end up succumbing to surgery, but I think that's still something you have to have to worry about wherever he ends up signing. Uh, I am seeing this tweet from John Heyman breaking Freddie. No, nah, not Freddie Freeman. Oh, uh, MLB owners vote unanimously to institute a lockout. It is expected to begin tomorrow. Again, we're recording this Wednesday night, but unclear what time. So uh, just confirming what we expected all along. But. There you go. Some some confirmation, at least from John Heyman on the matter. A few more smaller signings. Yes, we will get through these and then we'll talk about a bunch of players, whether they are done or not. Dylan Bundy signed a one year deal with the Minnesota Twins. Mike, I saw that you were tweeting about Dylan Bundy. Any hope here that he can potentially get back on track? Yeah, I, I dug into him, uh, I think, a week ago, just out of random, just to see, you know, what, what happened. I, it was really that slider that where he was throwing it. I mean, in the 2020, it was like really, you know, down and away to uh, uh, right right handed hitters and you know, this season, uh, 2021, he's really throwing it in the zone way too much. I think he had a career high zone rate, and that's just not going to get it done with this. You know, with the rest of this, it's not the best pitch to slide in of itself. It's not the best slider, so you can't really just keep that thing in the zone. So, I mean, if he starts to throw it, throw it out of the zone more, I think he'll get closer to what he did in 2020. But I don't think he'll ever get back to that point of striking out, you know, 12 guys and going like seven and seven innings and all that crazy ace stuff that he did. I think that was kind of that was kind of fluky, but he can be valuable for sure. Yeah, and it looks like, uh, at least as of now, looking at their rotation, they're going to need him. Uh, so, yeah. wow, I'm looking at their roster resource page. They have him penciled in as their SP1. As of, like It's Dylan Bundy, Bailey Ober. Obviously, Joe Ryan is there, so there's some hype there. Uh, Randy Dobnak, Lewis Thorpe. So, yikes. We'll see what happens uh, with the Minnesota wow. Twins. That's Clint, not good. That's not Quinn good. Frazier signed a one-year deal with the Chicago Cubs. They also signed Harold Ramirez last week. They have Ian Happ on the team. They have Rafael Ortega. They have Jason Hayward still on the roster. So uh, there's going to be some kind of crunch here when it comes to playing time. National League could have the DH, so I guess that's something that helps. Uh, but what do you think, Scott? Any any hope for for once uh, breakout hopeful Clint Frazier? Not really. If okay. I'm being honest, I, I think it's I think this is the sort of the sort of move that a, a rebuilding club should make. Um, take one last shot on a guy once perceived to have high upside that now is essentially free because uh, he's worn out his welcome at his previous stops. You know, so often these re these rebuilding teams will just fill in their open spots with obvious journeymen you know, barely hanging on to a major league job kind of guys. And th there's nothing, there, there's nothing to salvage from that. I mean, if you're, if you're committed to losing anyway, you might as well give your bats to somebody who could raise his 
value and, and become an asset for you, which Clint Frazier still potentially could, but the odds are definitely against it at this point. And um, I'm certainly not looking to target him in fantasy. Well, let's give I, credit I, where it's due. Uh, go ahead, Mike. Go ahead. I, I will say one thing. I mean, I, I feel like I feel like who we'll have to at least get an opportunity to get some playing time with the Cubs. You know what I mean? So, yeah. so I feel I feel like who will probably have like a ADP in like the 500, 600 range, 400 range, whatever. He could be one of those flyers that maybe does something. I don't know. Just throwing it out there. You know, you know, you never know. I mean, Super, twenty heading yeah. into last year, I thought Clint Frazier had broken through. Right? Yeah. yeah. That was, was just heading into this past year. Yeah. He was um, on my breakout list for, mm, for last season. You know, know uh, obviously was, Yankees aside, Homer, but he, he <laughs> thought it so hard, so yeah. hard after obviously plenty of misses before then, too. So it's yeah. just that it's just that pandemic shortened season where he looked like he was living up to his potential. That's basically all it's been. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The early ADP, if you're doing like draft champions leagues or anything right now, 529. So, I mean, you're getting them super late. And only a name to remember there with Clint Frazier. Let's give credit where it's due. The Cubs did find a few of these retreads. Again, Frank right. Schwindel and, and Rafael Ortega was really good for them as well. So, we'll see. Uh, we'll see what happens with uh, Clint Frazier. Cesar Hernandez signed a one-year deal with the Nationals. Rugnet Odor signed a one-year deal with the Orioles. Daniel Hudson signed a one-year deal with the Dodgers. Reminder, the Dodgers have not re-signed Kenley Jansen yet or any, I guess, surefire closer to this point. So uh, Blake Trinan, I think, would be the first man up there uh, if they don't sign anyone else. Yimi Garcia signed a two-year deal with the Toronto Blue Jays. Hector Neris signed a two-year deal with the Astros. Uh, Leori Garcia re-signed a three-year deal with the Chicago White Sox. So let's take a quick break. When we return, are these players done? We'll talk about it next. Fantasy Baseball Today. All right, so let's jump in. Are these players done? Let's fire up the... Dunzo meter one on the Dunzo meter means this player uh, has a lot left in the tank. They are not done. They're far from that. We are pretty excited to see what they can do and hopefully bounce back in fantasy baseball. 10 on the Dunzo meter stick a fork in him. He's done. There's nothing left. This, this person is not helping you in fantasy <laughs> baseball. Let's start with one of the more popular players to talk about this offseason. Scott, I crowdsourced Twitter. I asked who they wanted to hear during the segment and unsurprisingly, Cody Bellinger was a name that people wanted to hear a lot. Uh, he was historically bad this past season. 165 batting average, 10 homers, three steals in just 95 games. Coming off the shoulder surgery last offseason, he dealt with a calf injury earlier on this season as well. He also had a really bad 2020, obviously shortened season. He like tweaked his batting stance. Why, coming off of an MVP season in 2019, would you tweak anything? You're already really, really good, Cody Bellinger. Uh, but this past season, he was not. He gave us a little bit of hope in the 12 playoff games that he played. 353 batting average, one homer, five steals, a 35% line drive rate. Uh, but that is an extremely small sample size. Scott, Cody Bellinger on the Dunzo meter. Where are you? I'm glad you're giving me a whole range of of uh, options to choose from here because these these <laughs> Top ones are the most difficult. <laughs> uh, I'll go four on Cody Bellinger. So a little more to the side of I don't think he's done. I like he's still 26. So, you know, right in the prime of his career. And he was the league MVP in 2019, obviously. Since then, I, I think his he, he's just become a mechanical mess in between yeah. constant tinkering and injuries he's just totally lost his way and and that's something that can be regained with coaching and and um reps you know that's something that's something i feel like he can get back and i feel like if that happens it'll be like a, a switch turned on and, and it'll and like 2020 and 2021 never even happened for cody bellinger so uh, there's definitely a point where I would be excited to take a flyer on him. I mean, a flyer might be too strong because he's going to go in the middle round, the early to middle round. I, I have him as my number 29 outfielder, basically. So um, I draft him ahead of guys like Austin Meadows and uh, Robbie Grossman, guys I don't feel like really compare in terms of upside, but I'm not. I'm not drafting Bellinger at his upside anymore either. Yeah, his early ADP is 96. So 12-team league, you're looking at the 8-9 turn. I think that's a pretty fair value for a, you know, 
former MVP from from just you know. It two might years. be just a smidge early for me, but yeah. not not far off. Scott Boris, super agent, of course, for many players in baseball, had this to say about Cody Bellinger earlier in the offseason. Quote, he was injured. To Cody's credit, he tried to play through, and the Dodgers played him because he is a gold glove caliber player at two positions. Will be back to full strength in spring. Quote, learned a great deal about himself last year. Again, that is Scott Boris on Cody Bellinger. Micah, what do you think? One to ten on the Dunzo meter. Where are you at on Cody Bellinger? Scott had him. You said four. I, I have him at three. I, I think you know we got the same you know same type of uh, idea around him. I, and you, I think you hit on the head, Scott. You said you know it's a lot of a lot of mechanical stuff. You know a lot of injuries messing with his mechanics, messing with his you know confidence. There's, there's a lot. There's a lot of a lot of factors that go into you know a, a player that's going through everything that he went through over the last what sixteen and eighteen months. So I I, I think you know. Once he gets comfortable, once he gets all season to clear his head, gets mechanics right, he, I think he could be one of the better values. I, I've seen him go like, yeah, like seventh, eighth, ninth round. I think that could be one of those, you know, league winning picks that he, he could hit 30, 40, 30 home runs, uh, 270, 280 bad average, and 10 steals. That's, you know, that's a third, fourth round pick. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm all in on Belgium in 2022. Yeah, he's going four picks ahead of Giancarlo Stanton right now. Micah, who would you rather have, Stanton or Cody Bellinger? It's a good question. Give me that's a good question because I, I'm I, I've grown on the Stanton over the last over the last uh, a couple of years. Uh, but I, I I'll give me Stanton. I'll, I'll take Stanton. I'll give you, I feel I feel a little safer with him. I do. Scott, what do you think? Stanton versus Bellinger? I would take Stanton as well. I have Stanton 25th versus Bellinger 29th in my outfield rankings. So it's it's close, but yeah, I Bellinger has more upside. Yeah. Stanton is much more predictable. Yeah, it's yeah. just. Will he be healthy? That's, well, that's always the question with Stan, right? Yeah. We can't talk about Cody Ballinger without talking about Christian Yelich, right? It feels like these two are kind of married at the hip uh, at this point. <laughs> Christian Yelich, 248 batting average this past season, nine homers, nine steals in 117 games. He dealt with a lingering back injury, which has now affected him for you know, quite some time. It feels like he dealt with it you know, a couple of years ago where he, you know, he would go on the IL here or there, never to the point that it affected him uh, this past season, the ground ball rate spiked all the way back up to 54%, his highest since 2017, his last year that he was with the Miami Marlins. Micah, you get to start us off this time uh, with the Dunzo meter on Christian Yelich. Christian Yelich, uh, where, 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 where I put this down, I, I've, I have, I've Yelich at uh, 3.5. I decided to put a decimal in there just, just because I couldn't decide between three and four. But I, I, I think, I think a, a lot of, a lot of his problems also came because, you know, because of uh, injuries. That, that, you know, a back injury is, is, is one of the worst injuries any athlete in any sport could ever have. It limits everything you do. You know, what I mean, you can't, you can't, and in baseball, you really need your back to swing and everything. So I mean, and to run to steal bases. Well, he just wasn't 100. percent I think. Besides that, he he really wasn't really swinging much. His swing rate was at like sixty percent in the twenty twenty. It got back up to six seven percent in twenty twenty one. So I think as long as he's swinging the bat, as long as he's confident, he'll be able. To, and as long as he's you know fully healthy, he'll be able to, you know, do what he do what he does. I don't know if he ever gets back to thirty thirty, but I think he could definitely you know maybe maybe get to twenty twenty something like that with a decent band average. So, so yeah. So with Yelich, uh, the ground ball rate spiking, I think that's actually something that could come from the back injury, right? Like you can't loft the ball, you know, your your back is affecting you and helps you generate so much power. And it just mm -hmm. affects everything in the swing uh, and, and yeah. with your core when you're dealing with that kind of injury. The problem is we just don't really know. We, we don't really know where this injury is going to go. Is it going to get worse? Is it going to, is he just going to play through it? Is it going to stagnate? We saw Clayton Kershaw was affected by a back injury for multiple seasons, uh, you know, a couple of years ago. So, Scott, what do you think in Christian Yelich on the Dunzo meter? So, if, if Mike is going to do decimals, I'll do decimals <laughs> too. I'm, I'm going to go 5.5 5 on Yelich. I had Bellinger 4. I'm going 5.5 5 on Yelich, which means I'm leaning ever so slightly towards him being done. And that's, that's because I'm putting a lot of weight on this back injury and mm. just... I don't I don't want to write Yelich off because I know the upside is first round ability. Right? Like he he could I, I don't think it's outside the realm of possibility he could bounce back with another first round caliber season. I think that's definitely within uh his range of outcomes. So you know, I, I have to I have to respect that. And I do like that he got his strikeout rate down. I he still impacts the ball very hard, not as hard as he did for the majority of his career, but still hard relative to league average um but 
it's clear something's wrong with him. And a back injury is the kind of thing that can completely redirect a player's career. I mean, we have historic examples of this. Don Mattingly, you know, more recently Todd Helton. Like, their backs started bothering them, and they just stopped hitting for power. And kind of feels like we might be seeing that for Yelich. I, I hate to see it, but um, I, I do think... I do think it's a legitimate concern. So I only rank him one spot high behind Bellinger. I still would take a chance on him in about the same range, maybe like the 9-10 range, around 9-10 uh, is where I'd put him. But uh, I'm I'm not as hopeful for Yelich as I am for Bellinger. He is a little bit older than Bellinger, too, so I think that can make some sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, Christian Yelich, the early ADP, 105.7. So going a little bit after Bellinger, if you're playing in a 12-team league, that's the middle of the ninth round. Uh, Micah, who would you rather have, Bellinger or Christian Yelich? Give me Bellinger. Younger and feels like less of less of injury risk overall. Yeah, give me, give me Belly. Yep, and Scott, you mentioned that you have Bellinger one spot higher, so don't even need to ask you. Let's move on to mm-hmm. Kyle Hendricks. Everything... Finally caught up to him. 4.77 ERA, 1.35 whip. He gave up a career high 31 home runs in 2020. His previous high was 22. Oddly enough, a lack of control for Kyle Hendricks. Not that he was bad. Like he was just over two walks per nine, but that's bad for him. I mean, I mean, someone who like he lives on the fence so much, right? Like yeah. anything yeah. that anything that could push him over the edge. Um we, we just saw it, basically, right? So a combination of giving up more home runs and walks just completely doomed him this past mm-hmm. season. So the uh, early ADP for him, uh, all the way down at 263.2. I'll mention a few names in, in just a little bit who he's going around. But, Scott, what do you think? Kyle Hendricks on the Dunzo meter. I will go... I'll go three on Kyle Hendricks. I don't think he's done. I don't think he's done. He's about to turn 32. And he has a skill set that should age very well. You know, he throws DeLorean speeds, 88 miles per hour. (laughs) This is, uh, this is not somebody who relies on blowing it by hitters. And I think, I think last year, you know, he's just a little off at times. And when he had a stretch in the middle of the season, it was just quality start after quality start. I mean, he looked as reliable as he ever has. It's just, it was bookended by these stretches where he was getting crushed. Um, and I, I think it, that's, that's just part of, that's just part of the profile for Kyle Hendricks. He misses his spots a little bit and he, he can get crushed because he doesn't have that blow you away stuff, but a great control pitcher works deep into games. Um, still, you know, in the relatively early stages of his career, I, I think he's probably going to be okay. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna trust him to the extent I did last year. Like last year was by far the highest I ranked him, and I don't know, it was a bad idea. But <laughs> you know, if you want him as your number four starter, I, I, I think that could go okay for you. You were not alone, Scotty. Uh, a lot of people liked Kyle Hendricks coming off the shortened season because we were looking for volume. Who is someone that can give us innings, reliable innings? And it seems like that's who Kyle Hendricks was for so long. You mentioned that stretch that he had in the middle of the season, thirteen start stretch from. May 16th to July 21st, where he had a quality start uh, in 12 of 13 of those starts. He had a 2.50 ERA during that span. However, a 4.41 XFIP. So normally he outperforms his, his underlying numbers, but last yeah. year it just seemed, it seemed elevated. Um, I'm a little bit more worried uh, about Kyle Hendricks. Micah, where are you at? The, the Dunzo meter for Hendricks. I have him at a little buff, Scott. I have him at four. Uh, I, I I looked into it. I it was uh, had a lot to do with his fastball command. His fastball had a I think it was a career high, uh, fourteen point nine percent walk rate. And I think it, he just he wasn't as refined as he used to be in the past. I don't know what what the deal was, but he wasn't hitting his spots as precisely as he used to. So I think, he, as Scott said, he's still you know only thirty two years old. I think he can easily you know come back and just refine that command refine what he used to, what what he you know lives off of being you know in control of his pitches. I think he'll be fine if he does it. I I also want to mention 1.5 home runs per nine. That is very unlike Kyle Hendricks, who's more of a ground ball pitcher, not an extreme ground ball pitcher, but generally keeps the ball on the ground. And uh, I think, I think having that inflated home run rate was mostly about location, but one headline you didn't mention at the top of the show, Frank, is that (laughs) 
there there are reports that um, MLB was actually mixing in the older juice balls uh, with the newer yeah. deadened balls this season, yeah. and it's they were all mixed up apparently because of supply issues, reportedly. So though there's some there are some reasons to maybe doubt that as the excuse, but um, yeah, the <laughs> that variable just became. Uh, it just became a huge variable again and, and just it, because we can't really narrow down when one ball was being used and where it was being used and when the other ball was being used and um so in theory we could see more impacts from that heading into next year since we didn't get a pure sample of how the new ball will play in 2021 yeah i mean Baseball, what are we doing, man? Like, it is... I, I can't even say one step forward, two steps back. It's just constantly <laughs> two steps back, right? Like, yeah. what are we... Like, two different baseballs not telling anybody, right? Like, you have everything going on with the the sticky substances this past season as well. They told us before the year that they were going to use a new baseball that uh, was a little bit more deadened. They were trying to decrease home runs overall in the game. And then it comes out, they were still using the juice ball in, in some areas. So it's... Just, I don't know, like it's just a mess, one mess after another. Uh, we obviously we love baseball, we love fantasy baseball here, but it's just like get your act together, MLB. This is just a mess. Uh, Kyle Hendricks, I don't know, man. like maybe I'm just out on a limb. I kind of think he's done. Like, I, I think I would put him like seven on this meter here because I just for years he outperformed these peripheral numbers, and I don't know, like it just seems like it, everything finally caught up to him. Early ADP is 263.2, just ahead of names like Drew Rasmussen, Aaron Ashby who was a popular sleeper candidate with the Milwaukee Brewers and a fellow soft tosser, Marco Gonzalez. What do you think, Scott? Oh, I have him quite a bit ahead of those guys. Okay. Yeah. So you could wind up with a decent amount of Kyle Hendricks this upcoming season. Michael, yeah. what do you think of that price? Yeah, I'm, I'm, right, there, I'm right there with you. Like, at, that, at that price, I'd easily take him over Marco and, and Mr. Ashby. So yeah, uh, you, you said 260? 263. I don't, I don't think he's ever been that late ever. In his, I don't think, no. he's, I, don't, I don't think I remember him ever being that late. Yeah, I'll, I'll probably have a good amount of college this, this year. You know what? I always say it. I'm going to say it again. Uh, NFBC, you sell out for upside in NFBC. And Kyle Hendricks has never been an upside pick. Even last year, yeah. it's not like he was an upside pick, he was a safe pick. So yeah. um, just to put a number on it, I have Kyle Hendricks 59th in my starting pitcher ranking. So it's not like I'm going crazy firm or anything 59 right. i mean that's, that's more like a number five guy than a number four guy even like i mentioned earlier i have uh marco gonzalez 83rd mm. yeah i mean look i don't i don't like marco gonzalez either i they're they're pretty similar pitchers right um eh, kyle hendrix man i don't know hey Scott, <laughs> i know you bring up nfbc a lot it's the only adp that we have so i understand i i just want to <laughs> i just don't want to treat it as gospel i i yeah. understand it's better than nothing but the, yeah you know, it's it's skewed. Let's talk about some uh, New York middle infielders here. Francisco Lindor, his first season in the Big Apple with that massive contract. He hit 230 with 20 homers and 10 steals over 125 games. He missed time due to an oblique injury. He also struggled in 2020. We now have about 185 game sample of him being right around a 740 OPS bat. So that is uh, pretty bad. There's a chance that he was helped out by the bouncy ball when he was hitting all those home runs in 2018 and 2019 glass half full. He had a pretty big September 257 batting average, nine homers in 895 OPS. Michael, you can start us off here. Francisco Lindor on the Dunzo meter. I have him at two. I expect a decent size bounce back in 2022. You know, he had career low contact rates in 2021, but the quality contact was fire. I think he had a career best uh, hard hit rate. So I think, it's, you know, he's still hitting the ball hard. There's a lot going on here. This is a guy that just, you know, he's coming over to, to New York. He's, you know, he's a lot of hype around him. A lot of people expect him to be the guy. So, I mean, that's a lot of pressure on a player. So, I think once he gets comfortable, you know, in that lineup, in a better lineup now in 2022, I think, in a better better team in 2022, I think he'll be, you know, a lot more productive. Yeah, and we've seen that before. You know, first year with that big contract, there's, there's been many times where players fail to uh, perform in that first year. Uh, Michael, we were talking beforehand. You're a Phillies fan. I know Bryce Harper's yeah. first year there was not ideal either. Yeah. So these things happen when, when we get superstars in new places. Scott, what do you think about Francisco Lindor on the Dunzo meter? So I am going to say five. Ooh. I'm going to say five because I, I, 
it kind of depends what you mean by done. I mean, he, he's he can probably I think he can probably be better than he was last year. I don't think he's going to be first round caliber bat again, or even second round caliber bat again. I think he was tailor made for the juice ball era and he kind of leaned into it as it was happening because the home run explosion came the the juice ball era started basically the second half of 2016 2017 was the year he broke through as a 30 homer guy and he did it by elevating his launch angle kind of selling out for home runs and he's one of those guys i've referred to them um hit a lot of home runs in spite not having particular a particularly high average exit velocity. He stuck with that approach this past year with you know at least many of the balls being deadened, not all of them apparently, but uh, there was a you know obviously they weren't they weren't uh there were there were deadened baseballs this past year, right? And uh he stuck with that same high fly ball approach and they just weren't carrying over the fence for him. And, and when you're hitting a lot of fly balls and they're not going over the fence, it wrecks your batting average, which we saw happen to him. And I, I think the best thing he could do now is go through is go back to his initial approach prior to 2017, where he was more of a line drive hitter and, you know, maybe top out at 20 home runs rather than 30 plus. Um, and if he does that, you know, he'll, he'll still be a quality starter in fantasy, but I don't, I'm really not counting on him ever being that high end shortstop again. The early steamer projections on Francisco Lindor, 252 batting average, 30 homers, 13 steals. I think I would take the over on the batting average. You know, maybe we get 260, something like that. The under on the power. I I think, you know, maybe he's just like a 25 homer bat at this point, something like that. Mid twenties, uh, slight over maybe on, on the steals as well. 15 steals, you know, 25 homers, 15 steals, 260 bat. I, I think a lot of people would sign up for that where he's going right now, which is an early ADP of 51.9. So an early fifth round pick. I wish I was getting a little bit more of a discount coming off the shortened season, uh, coming off this past season, but uh, he's going just three picks behind Wander Franco. Scott, who would you rather have? I'd rather have Franco. Micah, what do you think? Wander Franco versus Francisco Lindor. I'll take Franco. Yeah, I, I agree. I that, give me the upside, and I mean, honestly, it might might be a better floor too. So, yeah. All right, I, well, I would take Jorge Polanco over Lindor. <laughs> oh, geez. I still have Lindor in my top twelve, and still want him as a starter. But I, I, I have, I have more confidence in Polanco's power than Lindor's at this point. All mm-hmm. right. Uh, Jorge Polanco, ADP of 91.6. So you could wind up with a lot of Jorge Polanco this upcoming season. Scott. None of Lindor, apparently. <laughs> yeah, apparently not. Uh, all right, so I have two, four, six, eight more players. Uh, we're, we're not going to be able to deep dive each one of these. Here's what we'll do. Uh, I'll let you guys alternate who uh, breaks down and gives analysis on a player, but you guys can still give out your your Denzo, Dunzo meter picks for each of them. Scott, you will get uh, Glaber Torres up next. I mentioned New York middle infielders. Uh, I don't know what is going on with this guy, but the past couple of years, it's like Space Jam style. Lost all the talent. It is just someone stole it. I don't know where it is, but the Glaber Torres does not have it anymore. There you go. Uh, 169 games since the start of 2020. A 255 batting average, 12 homers, 15 steals for Glaber Torres. The home run to fly ball rate has taken a huge step back. Maybe someone that was also helped by that bouncy ball. Uh, glass half full for him as well. Played 19 games at second base towards the end of the season, and he did perform better uh, then. 300 batting average, two homers, four doubles, and 815 OPS. Still not the player that he was, but looked a little bit more comfortable. Uh, really not a major league shortstop. He's he's very bad there. Uh, Scott, where are you at? Glaber Torres, Dunzo Meter. Uh, eight? Yeah, this one's wow. tough. Man. This one yeah. is tough. It's... um. <laughs> What everything I said about Lindor applies twofold to Glaber Torres mm. because I mean his his exit velocities, his hard hit rates were really blah early in his career, and he was hitting home runs in spite of that. And so when you see when you see basically the data remain unchanged year after year, and yet the production goes way down, especially 
when 2021 is the season you're keying in on with the change in the ball. Uh, I, th- I think that might pretty much tell the story. Uh, it's too early to say for sure. It's only one year of data and it wasn't, it, it was again, the variable wasn't what we thought it was. It was, uh, I, I keep getting tongue tied when I try to explain what I mean, but they were mixing in balls, right? They were mixing in juice balls and deadened balls. So we, the data was kind of corrupted in that way. But even so, uh, that might tell the story for Glaber Torres. Is just that that profile of hitter isn't going to be able to hit for power anymore. And if they don't, if they're not able to hit for power anymore. Then they really need to change their whole hitting makeup to, um, to to be a useful player. Yeah, and we also had that just crazy stretch in 2019 where he just destroyed Baltimore pitching, and like their pitching staff was historically bad that year. I think he hit like 13 homers in 19 games or whatever it was. So that was a lot of his production there. Uh, Micah, just give me a number, maybe a quick thought on Glaber Torres here, Dunzo Meter. I have him not as harsh as Scott, but I have him, I have him at seven. I, I, I'm, I'm, yeah, I, I, I agree with a lot of points Scott said. And going, speaking on the point where you said he has to, you know, kind of like adjust his game a little bit. He hit three twelve against breaking pitches in twenty twenty one, two eighty nine xba. I mean, he's so if he's you know doing adjust, adjust making adjustment to hit better against breaking pitches, that's gonna be better for average. But you know, the power isn't there. He had he had like an eighty one average ex- exit velocity against breaking pitches. That's not gonna get, gonna get it done. So yeah. Yeah. I, I, I miss him. I, I look, I watch a lot of Yankees games. He could not hit fastballs up in the zone. He just could not yeah. get to them. So uh, just quickly pulling it. Yeah. He had two thirty against fastballs this year. It's just like, it's not going to work. Like, you know, you, you got to be able to hit fastballs at this level. And uh, at least this past season, he couldn't do that. He was two fifty nine in 2020. So a little bit better, but not much. Let's move on to Hyunjin Ryu, 4.37 ERA, a 1.22 whip. Career low, 7.6K per nine with just a 9.7% swinging strike rate and maybe someone affected by the sticky substances because the first two months of the season, a 2.62 ERA with a near 11% swinging strike rate from June 1st on Hyunjin Ryu, a 5.37 ERA, just under 9% swinging strike rate. He did deal with some injuries, dealt with some off-season stuff, which we uh, off the field issues, which we found out after the fact. Apparently, he wasn't able to see his family for a long stretch of time. I believe it was because of COVID and the fact that the Blue Jays were not playing in their actual park and, you know, they were moving around. So he didn't get to see his family. And it's something that actually affected him and something that he talked about. So I don't know how we factor that into our analysis, but uh, Micah, you get Hyunjin Ryu here. Where is he at on the Dunzo meter? I have Ryu at four. And like you said, uh, Frank, there there is, you know, some factors outside the game that could be, you know, affecting his, you know, his overall uh, presence on the mound. I mean, his his command that, you know, he he's, he's, he's a guy that, you know, thrives off hitting his spot. And his command just didn't seem right uh, towards the end of the season. Just didn't seem right. His control was, he was, he was throwing the ball in the strike zone, but he just didn't, wasn't, you know, locating his pitches where, you know, where they're not as hittable as they, as they should have been. So he was getting, he was getting hit around a lot. So I, I think going forward, I'm not, I think he can turn that around. I think he can, you know, get his head right and just make the adjustments he needs to make. I think, yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not too worried about him. All right. A four from Micah Scott. Give us a number, maybe a quick thought here on Hyunjin Ryu. <laughs> I'm going to have to give a quick thought because I'm going nine on Hyunjin Ryu. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is the one I'm most worried about of all of them. Um, How are you going to give him a nine and give Kyle Hendricks a four, Scott? Come on, man. <laughs> well, <laughs> you saw basically all of Hyunjin Ryu's skill indicators just drop off the map, and he's going to be 35 next year, you know? True. And it just it just looks like a guy who got old. Maybe maybe the sticky substance band had something to do with it. Um, he's enough of a control pitcher that I'm not going ten. I'm not going ten. And and plus, you know, he's he's made some. He, he's had some other moments in his career where he made a big bounce back from injuries, in particular. I'm thinking. So I'm, I'm not going to write him off completely. But I'm like in a dynasty context. If I have Hyunjin Ryu. I'll shop him for whatever I can get, basically. I'll, I'll treat him like I was treating Patrick Corbin last season mm. in a in a dynasty league because you know somebody somebody out there like Micah might have more faith in him than I do. 
All right, let's uh, get back to my Yankees, right? Of course, we got to talk about the Yankees. DJ LeMahieu, 268 batting average, 10 homers, a 7 OPS. Maybe another victim of the uh, no bouncy ball this past season. He had a sports hernia down the stretch. Turns out he will have off-season core surgery. Uh, we don't know how long he was playing with that injury. Maybe it was something that affected him for a majority of the season. But, Scotty, you get DJ LeMahieu here, the Dunzo meter for DJ. So he might be the poster child for the effect of the the deadened baseball, because uh, when the ball was at its juiciest, is basically the only years when he hit for power, and then let, mm-hmm. and then twenty twenty one happens with the deadened baseball, and that power goes away. So I uh, I think he's probably what he was last year. That's just who DJ Lemayhew is going to be. Going forward, I'll give him a. I'll give him a nine, like I did Ryu. Oh gosh, uh, man, I'm pretty sure the Yankees have him for like four more years, so that is uh, not the best there, uh, Michael. What do you think, DJ LeMahieu? Give me a number here. I, I, I have him at five. I mean, we are we already know the profile is sketchy, limited, you know, bearability, lots of ground balls, but he, it's the contact hitters. You know, he's the elite contact hitter, and, and he hits the ball hard a lot. So I think I think he could sneak sneak to 15, 16 home runs, sneak a good 280 bad average, sneak five or six slow bases and have a quietly productive season if, if oh. everything goes right. All right. I like the sound of that. Hopefully <laughs> we can make that happen because <laughs> oh gosh, uh, I hope I hope he's not completely done. Uh but there, there's definitely a chance. Maybe maybe that you know injury affected him more than uh they were leading on. You Darvish had a 4.22 ERA a 109 whip uh, after an exquisite shortened 2020 season and uh, a really, really strong second half of 2019 as well. Definitely seems sticky stuff related. Uh, 5.60 ERA from June 1st on. He also allowed a lot more fly balls this year. 45% fly ball rate by far a career high, which led to 28 home runs allowed. Micah, you get you Darvish. Where's he at on the Dunzo meter? I have you Darvish at six, and I I I just think it's sticky stuff. I think that really did affect him, and that can't be you know understated. I think that you know these pitchers get used to having this stuff on their fingers, used to using it to do whatever they have to do to succeed, and to just have that gone midseason really did affect him. So yeah, I think I don't know if it's gonna if it's gonna be the same pitcher going forward, but we'll see. But I'm, I'm I don't think in drafts I don't think I'm willing to take the take the risk in most cases. Yeah. The- the ADP for Darvish is interesting too because it's 88. So it's not like it completely plummeted, but it is, you know, it's pretty low compared to where it was last year when he was like a yeah. second round pick. So now, you know, we're getting him in this what, eighth round range right now for you, Darvish, in a 12 team league. If you're buying that he can get back to that Cy Young caliber pitcher, then, you know, you're, you're getting him at a potential steal. But Scott, what do you think? Give me a number, you, Darvish. So it's a shame we're going lightning round now because I think this is where we have all the disagreements because <laughs> what's the lowest I've handed out so far? Uh, maybe a three, three or four. Well, okay. I'll go, I'll go three for Darvish. I'll go three for Darvish. The timing with the sticky substances, you know, that that's definitely suspicious, but I think it might be a red herring. You mentioned it, Frank, his fly ball rate was much higher than usual and that was true from the beginning of the season i remember looking at it at some point in may or june and thinking huh you darvish is really outperforming his xfip here are those fly balls going to catch up to him and they did in the second half and i don't don't know if the sticky substance band contributed to that it it helped exacerbate the effect or but he was playing with fire all along and like he's he's had these really infuriating stretches in his career, right? Part of it's because he has like six pitches that he's constantly, um, he's constantly reshaping his arsenal Mm -hmm. based on how those pitches are performing for him. And I I think, I think he may have just been a victim of his own tinkering this past year. I, I, the stuff is still electric. I think, um, I think there's a, I think more likely than not, he has some high end years left in him. Scott, did you have him on any fantasy teams? Yeah. Oh, man. I, I know that we tell listeners not to do this, but I am. I had him last year, and it is just hard for me to 
to just go back to it. And it, you're you're not supposed to play fantasy that way. I understand. And now we're getting them at a discount. So maybe right, the discount. If there wasn't a discount, I could understand. Yeah. But there's a pretty significant discount now. I just remember it was like one start on. One start on, I would like would bench him, and then you know the coming off that start, you're like, okay, well, I have confidence in him again. You put him back in your lineup. He gets rocked by the Diamondbacks or something. Like mm. it, it was so clear. Yeah. I remember he would have these great matchups, and then you'd put him in your lineup, and he would get rocked. And then he would go out against a tougher team the next time out. You bench him then, and then he would have a great start. It was so frustrating, and he was so hard to figure out in the second half. We'll see what happens with the baseball. They're talking about maybe like pre-tacking the baseball, so it has a substance on it already that could help the pitchers. But man, yeah. like Darvish was just so, so, so hard to figure out last year. Uh, the last one we'll actually talk about here is uh, Trent Grisham. I'll give you three names at the end. You could just give a quick thought on each. But uh, Trent Grisham, 242 batting average, 15 homers, 13 steals a 740 OPS in 132 games. The home run to fly ball rate uh, went from 20% in 2020 down to 12% in 2021. The weirdest part, what I was worried about coming into this past season was would he play against lefties? You know, how good would he be against lefties? He was much better against lefties this year than he was against righties. So that wasn't even the issue for Trent Grisham. So Scotty, you get this one, the Dunzo meter, Trent Grisham. Well, I hate to sound like a broken record. I'm going to go seven on Grisham, and my skepticism with him is the same for so many of the other hitters we talked about. He just doesn't hit the ball all that hard, and he managed to hit you know, a lot of home runs back when we were still working with the juicy baseballs, but I I don't think I don't think uh that's a possibility in in this new world we're living. Like that's the that's the hitter profile clearly that I'm most worried about. And when we saw it, we saw it affect a lot of players already. And I think it could it could potentially get even worse. It could potentially affect even more players. If I'm paying a lot more attention to exit velocity now for hitters than I have in, in previous years because it, it seems to have um, it it seems to have a stronger correlation with outcomes now in this uh, this new hitting environment we're looking at. So I like that Grisham gets on base. Obviously, he can contribute some stolen bases. That's why I'm going seven on him versus eight for Glaber Torres versus nine for uh, DJ LeMahieu. But I, I don't think we're going to see the 2020 version of Grisham again. Scott, you're going to have a, a pool of about 10 hitters that you could draft in 2022. I think one of them is uh, Jorge Polanco. I know you like Kyle Schwarber a lot, uh, and then we'll figure out the other eight. But it seems like there's a lot of hitters <laughs> that you're actually pretty worried about. And I, yeah. I get it. Uh, I get you know, it. That, that's, that's, kind, that's part of the reason why I'm doing an about face here with the pitchers <laughs> versus hitters who, who I invest most of my assets in. I'm, I'm back onto the hitters because... It just feels like um, it just feels like the the hitting crop, the useful hitting crop, is narrower than it's been in recent years. All right, Micah, you have a number for Trent Grisham on the Dunzo meter. Yeah, I have him at five. All right. Uh, anything yeah. else that you'd like to to add on him? A quick call. I, I did want to say quick. I, I have a lot to say, but I'll try to I'll try to summarize it. So <laughs> so I, 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 yeah, I didn't want to you know go on a rampage. But so twenty twenty one, he it really was he he hit two eighteen against fastballs. I think that's going to improve. You know, he's a young guy. I think that's important. And he his zone contact was a career high eighty seven point seven percent twenty twenty one. I think for a young guy that's hitting hitting in the zone that much and a guy that can hit. Per, can improve his quality of contact. I think there's potential for him to improve his his metrics overall. I think he could set a career high max exit exit velocity in 2022 or 2023. So I think there's still room for improvement, given that he's so young, and given that he does have you know these raw tools that he can use. So it's five, it's just just you know just in the middle. All right, a little bit more optimism there for Trent Grisham, uh, Scott. I'm going to give you three players, and you have uh, no more than 30 seconds to give out your numbers and, and say anything you want. So good luck, uh, Chris Paddock. Charlie Blackman and Zach Greinke. They all might be cooked. So, uh, yeah, uh, I will go. Oh, man. I, most of my 30 seconds is just going to be me thinking. I'm going <laughs> to go um, nine on Chris Paddock. It might be a little high. I'm going to go eight on Charlie 
Blackman, like I don't think he's going to be prime Charlie Blackman, early round Charlie Blackman again, but I, I think he's still pretty useful just as he is. So I don't, I don't know. Eight, I'll say. And Zach Greinke, seven. Zach Greinke, a free agent as well. So we'll see where he winds up. Chris Paddock, probably my biggest L of 2021. I, I did have quite a bit of him. Finishes with an ERA over five, dealt with COVID and elbow injury. It was just a complete mess. He only has the two pitches. You know what? I'm going to drop Granky to six. Okay. I, I mean, I'm actually with you on Chris Pack. Like, maybe it's an eight or whatever. He's still young-ish. Maybe he can figure it out. Michael, what do you think? Those three names, Chris Paddock, Blackman, Zach Granky. So Paddock, I have a five. I, I still think he's still developing. I I, I like him a lot. Uh, Granky, I have him at 6.5. I, uh, you know, he's he's declining. He's in the decline. And Blackman, no stolen bases, not a lot of power, but he will hit for average. So I'll give him a seven. Yeah, Blackman, 35 years old. Lineup is looking pretty awful there with the Colorado Rockies. All right, that's going to do it. We're going to wrap up here. Uh, once again, I want to thank Micah for coming on, a contributor for NBC Sports Edge, Fan Tracks, Roto Ranks, New Life Fantasy. That is quite the resume, man. You got, yeah. you got a lot of stuff going on right now. <laughs> yeah. uh, make sure you follow him on Twitter, <laughs> at Fantasy Central One. We appreciate you coming on here, Micah. Appreciate it uh, for having me on, man. This, this was fun. All right, for Scott and Micah, I am Frank. Thank you all for listening and watching Fantasy Baseball today. We'll be back again on Tuesday. Bye-bye.